raisin browning, which at late stages does involve caramelization, or baking of sweet cherries. Now, it happens that sweet cherries are commonly uh, prepared after baking. That is, you do the sweetening after baking, and the reason is that you get more caramel-like flavors, the raisiny kind of flavors, if you bake the wine when it's sweet. So it's usually not done, but if you don't pay attention to that, you can have interrelationships here. The sugar amino type Maillard reaction is also non-enzymatic and also tends to occur in uh, low water, fairly high heat conditions, so that in baking of uh, breads and baked goods, the browning of the crust or the browning of the uh, uh, cookie might be, uh, or often is, related to this kind of reaction. And different free amino acids will uh, react different rates with different sugars. In the case of the sugar, it's mainly the proportion that's in the carbonyl compound or carbonyl form that's important. And that's one reason why fructose also is generally more uh, apt to produce rapid uh, browning in the Maillard type as well as perhaps in the carbonyl type or the caramel type. The phenolic then being the remaining, remaining kind, and I didn't say so here, but this is non-caramelization, doesn't require oxygen. Maillard reactions don't require oxygen, but phenol browning does. So phenol browning is oxidative, the others are non-oxidative. The phenol browning is considered enzymatic, and the others are non-enzymatic. I think, in fact, that's a pro uh, uh, caused more trouble than it's helped, however. The idea that if you read in books like the Advances in Food Research, you tend to see reviews on non-enzymatic browning, and they'll talk then about uh, usually Maillard reactions, sometimes a little bit about caramelization. And then on enzymatic browning, they talk about phenolic. Well, I think this has con confused the issue because we've been able to demonstrate, and it's easy, others have shown also, that a lot of the browning of phenols in wines and other foods is non-enzymatic, or certainly need not be enzymatic. So I think the fact that they tend to consider phenolic browning as only enzymatic has obscured understanding of it. And while it is true that it's only one of the three major kinds of browning that is enzymatic or can be, it need not be. So, and it also is oxygen uh, involved and the others need not be. Although again, uh, oxidation may produce carbonyl compounds, which then will enter into the Maillard type reaction. Uh, and uh, furfural and derivatives are carbonyl compounds produced during caramelization. So while I'm indicating that these can be separated, I don't mean to say that they don't overlap and interact a good deal if, if it's possible to do so. While I'm on the point, we, uh, I had a student, uh, Vivian Polk, some years ago, P-A-U-C, a uh, young lady from France, uh, from the food science side, and she wanted a problem, and we had one that we thought was quite interesting. In fact, if some of you are, I think most of you are nearly through, but if someone is interested in a in a master's problem, <clears throat> I'd like to see her work extended. But the idea was, we said, all right, let's take a look. Can we examine brown products and decide which of these reactions was mainly involved in forming the brown? And if you figure caramelization reactions are involving mainly sugars, and the products of the brown should include uh, derivative of hydroxyferferal and so on, uh, this should be fairly polar. And to the degree the sugar isn't broken down and dehydrate dehydrated completely. These should be rather polar compounds, but they shouldn't be affected by pH. Uh, the Maillard compounds, on the other hand, should in, con, will contain nitrogen. Therefore, uh, they should be also rather polar, but they should be affected by pH, so that using our ammonium sulfate ethanol solution and burying the pH of the aqueous solution, we ought to be able to distinguish between browns produced from caramel Browns produced by Maillard by their relative partition at different pHs in the, between the aqueous and ethanol layers. And it turns out you can do that. Um, and the phenolic browns, on the other hand, uh, are acidic to the extent they retain phenolic OH groups, and uh, whereas the products here with amines would be basic. So again, they might be affected by pH, but they'd be affected oppositely, and they're much more ethanol soluble than the products of these two reactions. So it turns out it is possible to use that kind of a system and distinguish in gross effect uh, among these possible reactions. That's why we, it was possible for her to say then that as a raisin <coughs> dries in the sun,
the first seven days or so uh, are due to phenolic browning, and then the last uh, week or so of ordinary sun drying of raisins is caramelization, so that we could actually show the effects of the different reactions, and it's been a pretty good system. What we'd like to do now is extend this so that we could take any brown material and analyze it and say, uh, of the 100% brown that was there, X percent was due to caramelization, Y percent due to phenolic browning, and so on. But uh, as far as wine is concerned, it's turned out that essentially all the browning, except possibly in baked sweet cherries, uh, is from phenol. So we needn't worry about any other kind of browning except as it may inter interfere or overlap with phenolic browning. Yes? Um, are there any browning problems caused by either heating the must or like hot pressing like they do back east? Apparently not. For one thing, uh, even though we think it was a pretty strong sugar solution, it's 25% or less, and uh, this is highly aqueous and, and the heating is still at 100 degrees or thereabouts, you see, so that it, if you put on, uh, you make maple syrup, uh, you put on the sugar sap, it's colorless. It doesn't start getting colored until it gets down to around uh, 30 plus uh, bricks. And uh, so no, I think it's, there's no caramelization of significance in the usual kind of must processing. Now you could get uh, uh, surface effects. Uh, if you have a very hot surface and run something over it, Locally, you may get it uh, due to pressure or, or uh, uh, caking. You may get uh, some caramelization at a hot surface, but properly managed, and that would give cook flavors and so on, so we wouldn't do it as a rule. Properly managed, I think we can ignore it, except in maybe sweet cherries. Uh, and uh, even then, it's apt to be because uh, you've added uh, uh, concentrate that's been overheated. This kind of thing, you can get caramelization, but otherwise, you're not too likely. You may know that one of the ways to tell if your concentrate is made right is to measure the furfural derivatives in it. If it has much furfural derivative, it was overheated. Uh, if it's low in furfural derivatives, it was made with good vacuum and not overheated. Uh, well, again, uh, furfural derivatives are related to caramelization so that uh, you could tell whether you were having any trouble with that. Now coming back, trying to sketch out what we've said a time or two before, the typical phenol or other colorless compound, if it absorbs at all, would absorb in the UV or I suppose conceivably in the infrared, not where we could see it. If it absorbs between about uh, 400 and 800, we'd say that it has visible color. And as we've discussed before, as, as we shift by oxidation, so if we had a phenol at 280 and oxidized it to a quinone at 340, this oxidized material would have a spillover, uh, the, the ski jump or ski run type of spillover into the visible. So its maximum would probably still be outside the visible. If the maximum was in the visible and you had a sharp maximum in the visible, then it would have a specific color. But if it's just a spillover, it'll have a non-specific yellow. And as you increase the concentration in solution, you would raise that yellow from amber uh, possibly to brown, and of course if you get it concentrated enough, no light goes through and that becomes black. So that uh, we can have two kinds of increased browning. We can have a spillover effect that just due, but due to concentration, notice it not only absorbs more intensely, but it comes over further and further into the visible. In other words, if you're uh, if at a dilute solution, you're only making a significant absorbance at this wavelength. If you concentrate the solution, you will uh, move it over and ex it'll extend further into the vi visible, shifting then from yellow to amber to brown and eventually to black. But also, you can produce further shift into this uh, area. And, and notice that what I'm showing is not only, if, if it's a matter of concentration, these lines should parallel each other. If it's a matter of not only concentration, but additional species and additional, say, oxidative treatment, then you would expect the uh, curve to pivot as well as to parallel and increase by concentration. And that's what I'm tending to indicate here with maybe some suggestive blips without actual maxima on the brown. Or in other words, put it another way, there are many species then making many molecular species making up a mixture that we would describe as brown. Uh, there's a lot of old uh, jokes, you know, that they pull on the apprentice-type kid and the 
a sh high school shop class like go get me the board stretchers or bring me the left-handed monkey wrench and this kind of thing. Well, in chemistry vein, you could pull a similar one, uh, with a little bit more sophistication maybe, by setting a student to isolate a pure brown pigment. And of course, he would go crazy because it doesn't uh, turn out to be possible. There is no, there is never going to be a nice crystalline brown pigment. Now, you may think of having seen some pretty crystals in a bottle sometime that were brown, but I can guarantee you that was for other reasons, contamination or something else. In other words, the only way you're going to get nondescript wide absorption of the brown or black type is to either have it so concentrated you can't get any light through it or uh, have a mixture of several kinds of things. And one of the best, uh, most clear-cut stories of a brown type series of compounds is in the case of melanin, which we've mentioned before. Melanin are the reds and blacks and browns of animal skin, feathers, hair, what have you. So that uh, this is the kind of reaction that one gets. If you start with tyrosine, enzymatically oxidize that to dopa or dioxy, dihydroxy uh, phenylalanine, uh, and then oxidize that again to the quinone form, then this would be called dopaquinone. Dopaquinone will condense with itself to make this indole type derivative, which is called leucodopachrone. Now, obviously, then, that converts from the leuco condition to dopachrome, and dopachrome is this structure with a, uh, at least I think best written with a zwitter ion, a minus charge on one of the phenolic OHs, and then this uh, quinone amine or imine type structure with a positive charge on the nitrogen to make a zwitter ion. And this leucodopachrome has an absorption at 475 nanometers and is a red compound in, uh, in the solution. The, the dopachrome then uh, can uh, convert to uh, decarboxylate and con convert to dihydroxyindole, which is colorless, absorption, uh, well, faint yellow maybe, but basically colorless. And then this could oxidize to the 5,6-quinone uh, form, which has an absorption at 450, and it oxidizes still further in ways that are not too well known into melanochrome, which is a purple compound, absorbance at 540. And uh, it, melanochrome, becomes melanin, uh, which is a larger polymer of the same sort, and the melanin reacts with the sulfur groups of protein to make melanoproteins, which uh, the melanoproteins uh, are the actual pigment as found in hair and skin. And interestingly enough, the more sulfur link, the redder the compound. So a red-haired person has a fairly low melanin content with a high sulfur attachment, whereas a person with brunette hair, dark hair, uh, has a high percentage of the melanin with a relatively small amount of sulfhydro group protein attached to it. Uh, this sequence is reasonably well known, and it's drawn out, I think, too prettily. Because it turns out, if we look at, at the general reaction in a different way, uh, the reaction is not one to two to three to four, but rather it's all can interact with each other just about. From the DOPA stage on, each of these compounds is capable of producing a semiquinone and reacting with its own semiquinone or another semiquinone to give melanin-type pigments. So the melanin pigments are, in fact, a very heterogeneous group made from a, a series of fairly well-documented reactions, but interacting across the system uh, so that you get a rather complicated mixture of compounds. And uh, several people have tried to characterize the unit structure of melanin in various ways so that we get the quinone-type monobonding type, we get a quinone dibonding type, we get a zwitter ion poly uh, double bonding type of structure. And these were structures that were originally proposed by uh, Raper and then modified by Mason. But our present picture of melanin looks more like this. And this is work by a man by the name of Nicholas, and, uh, or Nicolaus, I'm not sure how he pronounces it and uh, working largely with squid ink. You may have worked with India ink and didn't realize it, but that's squid ink, or at least originally it was. And this squid ink is a cloud that the squid puts out when something's about to catch it, and it makes a smoke screen and disappears. Well, this squid ink is a 
pure melanin or relatively pure and not contaminated with much of anything else, so it's been most studied. And you get what is intended to be now a heterogeneous uh, molecule or group of molecules which have all sorts of linkages. It has peroxide linkages, it has decarboxylated uh, uh, dopochrome units and it has those that still retain the carboxy group. It has linkages with uh, cross bridging from what was the carbonyl. It has linkages carbon to carbon. It has linkages carbon to nitrogen, I think. Well, I don't find an example. In any case, it has just about every kind of linkage that one could have and this would represent the uh, cysteine linkage or the protein linkage that would be tying it into uh, the protein. Uh, in studying this kind of compound, uh, they go to rather drastic lengths. For instance, they cook up the uh, melanin for uh, 24 hours in concentrated HCl and this kind of treatment, uh, which would hydrolyze off uh, the protein it itself, leaving only the sulfhydro uh, unit behind. Uh, and another point to be made then is this is probably too stylized even so because not only would there be quinone chromophores uh, and uh, other chromophores of a poly uh, uh, conjugated type like for instance if we follow these uh, bonds here we'd have rather extensive conjugated systems that are built up but also we would have free radicals trapped in the system and this free radical trapping mechanism uh, serves two purposes, or at least can be looked at two ways. One is there are free radicals in the melanin which are stabilized by this large uh, polymeric structure which either gives a conjugated double bonding system which can smear out the uh, free radical and therefore stabilize it, or it can uh, protect it in a steric way. In other words, a big three-dimensional molecule. I've drawn this flat, but you can realize by pivoting around these bonds and further polymerization it would be three-dimensional then you can trap a free radical or other reactive species inside a portion of the molecule where it can't further react. Now what importance does that have? Well, it has a number of importances. One of the reasons that animals produce melanin is so they won't get sunburn and the damage caused by sunburn is from UV which produces uh, uh, react reactions including free radical mechanisms in the skin. So that here we have a a scavenging agent that would prevent the buildup of mobile free radicals by reacting with them or serving as a sink for their uh, incorporation and preventing uh, damage. And by the same token, it's quite interesting that irradiation damage of the atomic energy type, uh, cobalt, uh, gamma rays, or what have you, is also inhibited by melanin. So that if you have, uh, say, black mice as opposed to white mice, and irradiate them in an atomic reactor, the black mice will survive better than the white. Uh, so that it is a protective unit of that sort, and the main point to be made then, it does explain why reactive species can be trapped and why they may be useful. Now that's the nitrogen-containing type, even though it was mainly phenolic, remember. These reactions were mainly phenolic, even though it involved the nitrogen of the dopamine. And if we look again at our oxidative condensation methods, uh, mechanisms, considering the, the um, free radical semiquinones, we can get all these sorts of species, as we've mentioned before. But suppose we're looking mainly at this kind of, uh, of a species. Then if we continued that sort of reaction, we could produce a catechol derivative that we might consider a pseudomelanin. And if we were trying to draw a pretty picture of it, we might draw it looking like that. So that that would be a completed molecule and notice that as drawn it's in a completely reduced condition but these linkages and, and we're saying this compound would have been produced by taking catechol and oxidizing it uh, the oxidations would lead to the semiquinone and then that would lead to the formation of the covalent bonds and if you work out the average it means it'd be three to four atoms of oxygen used per original use of unit of catechol so this comes back to another point that we raised on uh, your second test, and that it's uh, a continuing type of reaction and not just one reaction with one catechol with a, one atom of oxygen to give a quinone, but rather then that will polymerize and be able to be oxidized again. And we could, of course, polymerize further onto the open position. Uh, if we take one of the central completely substituted catechols, then there'd be a bond in four positions, 
Presumably each of those would have been uh, involved from one oxygen and therefore uh, four atoms of oxygen would have been used. Now again we could visualize oxidizing it once more to give the orthoquinone derivative and by shifting the electrons around we could have a molecule with orthoquinones and uh, orthodihydroxybenzene units in the same molecule and which part is oxidized and which part is reduced would be subject to electron migration and a very fluid system. So this would be more like the browns of plant material. The animal material browns mostly contain high levels of nitrogen. The plant material browns mostly have low levels of nitrogen, but it's usually not zero. So again, a very stylized representation. Uh, probably in the real natural case, you do find uh, amino acids included uh, by the other kinds of reaction with the quinones as, as they're produced. Uh, the blacks of, say, watermelon seeds and this sort of thing have been studied and they mostly uh, look of this general nature, except, of course, it would involve natural phenols, not catechols. So it would be flavonoid derivatives and or uh, cinnamic acid derivatives that seem to be involved, but the nitrogen content is quite low. Of course, uh, if we're going to involve flavonoids to make that kind of uh, compound, you might be interested in some of the reactions that have been shown to occur with uh, different flavonoids. So for instance, if in a model system you oxidize catechin with hydrogen peroxide and peroxidase, you produce a number of compounds. First of all, you produce 8-hydroxy uh, catechin, which oxidizes further. In other words, you're inserting an OH group in the 8 position, and then that converts by further oxidation to a compound known as catechone and this has been uh, both 8-hydroxycatechin and catechone have been isolated from such a system. Uh, also, 2'8-dehydrodiacatechin uh, has been produced and it apparently will convert further to a compound known as dehydrodiacatechin A, which has been pretty well proven to have the structure as shown here. So we get, in other words, a complicated group of oxidative interreactions and you could visualize reactions of these kinds going on to make a very heterogeneous mixture of polymers, no one molecule of which need represent or be the same molecular weight of a molecule, uh, of uh, any other molecule of the same series, but together they would give a brown mixture. Uh, this brown mixture would have uh, properties in common, but would not uh, have a single species of any one sort and the molecular weight would differ, the number and kinds of linkages would differ, but they'd be similar. And it's quite interesting, and I think very helpful, that even though phenolic browning can be enzymatic or non-enzymatic, the products seem to be the same, regardless of which way it goes. And the reason that this is so, evidently, is that the enzymes are mainly active in producing the initial oxidation. And then everything that has, which would visual, could be visualized then is the free radical semiquinone. Everything that happens after that is chemistry and not enzymatically controlled. So that ordinarily uh, that's, that would be why one would expect the reactions to give essentially the same kind of products whether an enzyme was involved or not. And that does make studying it a little bit more simple even though it's still complicated because of the heterogeneous nature. Um, not only that, but the initial semiquinone also would be generally the easy, uh, equally easily formed or it would be, if you had a mixture of phenols, the phenol that is most easily oxidized from a redox potential viewpoint and uh, structural viewpoint would be the one that would oxidize chemically. Generally, it's also the one that would oxidize first enzymatically. So again, the enzymes don't ignore uh, the chemistry of, uh, of the reaction, but rather they uh, profit from uh, being able to lower the activation energy and encourage the reaction that otherwise would go anyhow. So particularly in the case of enzymatic browning, uh, generally speaking, the sequence of disappearance of phenols and conversion to oxidative products and the uh, relative kind of the product produced is about the same whether it's enzymatic or not, given a given substrate mixture. Uh, we should say a little bit about the enzymes involved, but I don't want to spend very much time upon them. Uh, we have pretty good evidence that the reactions that we're concerned about in food products, and particularly in wine aging, are not enzymatic. And these are 
and, and as I've just said, it may become uh, academic anyway, since the reactions and products tend to be the same, whether it's enzymatic or not. One reason that we have evidence that these are not enzymatic over the extended kinds of time we're talking about in storage is that the enzymes are inactivated by the products of oxidation. Now, we've been showing how quinones can react with proteins to produce co covalent bo bonds and so forth. Well, the enzymes, including those that oxidize phenols, are proteins or in can include protein. And uh, this, uh, of course, can react just like any other protein. So it's generally found that about one out of 100,000 reactions uh, produces an inactivation. In other words, as you produce products, the products react with the enzyme, and on the average in a dilute condition, about one uh, out of 100,000 of the turnover would lead to an inactivation of the enzyme. And of course, as reaction products build up, uh, then uh, this would make it very much uh, uh, more likely that the enzymes would be inactivated. So if browning does occur, the en browning enzymes tend to be inactivated. Uh, as well as other enzymes for that matter. A uh, second point is that the enzymes, of course, tend to be precipitated with tannin, just like any other protein, and they also tend to uh, be inactivated with thyme, just like any other protein. So that when we talk about pasteurization to produce uh, uh, enzyme death or microorganism death because of enzyme death, uh, clearly we were talking about just speeding up a reaction that occurs slowly at cooler temperatures. And in wine, the uh, half time of added tyrosinase is only a few days at room temperature. One of the things that uh, uh, Sergio Traverso worked on when he was doing his masters with me was just this. In fact, that's what he started on. Let's buy enzymes, add them to wine, measure how fast the activity disappears, and hopefully show that enzymes cannot be involved in wine aging, or at least find out if they are. Well, uh, he got so fascinated with uh, polyphenol oxidase, he didn't go ahead with any other enzymes, but at least in the case of that enzyme, while it's possible to preserve it in, say, refrigerated or uh, freezer-stored wine for a reasonable number of weeks uh, or months even, uh, in the normal circumstances in the wine cellar or at room temperature, the half-life is very short, and so it would be possible to say that browning reactions and uh, any other aging type reaction of, of wine related to tyrosinase at least uh, should not occur. Uh, the enzyme should be destroyed in a relatively short time at room temperature. Uh, that being so, uh, I, at least I feel partially vindicated in saying that uh, browning of wine after its initial fermentation at least is probably unlikely to be enzymatic. Uh, is very like in pasteurization or whatever is certainly not going to prevent further browning. It's likely to be chemical. Um, the phenolase, which proper name by the uh, enzyme nomenclature uh, uh, commission, is orthodiphenol O2 oxidoreductase, but we tend to call it polyphenol oxidase, tyrosinase, or just phenolase. Uh, this enzyme is a copper-containing enzyme. It is found in many plant materials, and uh, it has two main actions. It has what's commonly called a cresolase action. Cresol, remember, is methylphenol, and the methylphenol is converted to a catechol-like dihydroxy derivative by the oxidation of the monophenol to the orthodiphenol. And that's why this enzyme is called an orthodiphenol uh, oxidoreductase because it has the capability of inserting an OH group and producing a dihydroxy derivative from a monohydroxy derivative. The uh, phenol that's inserted is ortho to the original one and interestingly enough there must be a trace of diphenol present for this action to occur. So it is evidently to some degree autocatalytic. Uh, again the mechanism isn't really known in detail but uh, uh, a good deal of facts are known about it. The second action of the enzyme is having then an orthodihydroxy uh, benzene derivative, an orthophenol, it will oxidize that to the orthoquinone. And this is known as the catechylase action. So the enzyme commonly has two kinds of action, the cresolase action to insert an OH group and the catechylase action to convert that orthophenol into the orthoquinone. 
Uh, these two actions apparently occur in the same protein, but they seem to occur at different sites. And the evidence for that is that, for instance, uh, different activating and uh, inactivating agents can influence one action with relatively little effect on another, on the other. So that uh, it does appear, while they've never been separated, and it doesn't appear that there are two enzymes involved, the behavior indicates uh, two sites, or at least the, the sites involved uh, in the action are not exactly the same or exactly at the same point. Also, you can find enzymes in nature that behave differently in their relative cresolase catechylase activity and which substrates they will work on. So, for instance, uh, uh, the uh, enzyme from grapes is uh, very active in oxidizing flavonoids and uh, synamic derivatives and uh, paracumeric acid, for instance, is a good substrate for the grape enzyme, whereas the potato enzyme, paracumeric acid is uh, inactive in, with it uh, and uh, uh, the ratio of uh, relative activity of different substrates would be different uh, for other synamate versus flavonoid derivatives. Potato enzyme generally not very good against flavonoids or to oxidize flavonoids. Um, the Enzyme activity in different grapes uh, is, is mentioned. You notice that in the Carignan ser series, there are black, pink, and white uh, sports of Carignan, and the activity falls as you have less color. But in another uh, similar series, like the Grenache, it's, it's uh, not that uniform. And in the case of an unnamed variety, the black one is only a fourth as active as the white one. So that uh, you can't make any firm rules as to phenol content versus uh, uh, oxidative enzyme content. And this is one reason why uh, white grapes brown differently, and they may brown differently for more than one reason. Uh, they may brown differently because they have more or less phenolic substrate for the enzyme, but they may also brown differently because they have more or less active enzyme. Uh, Traverso showed an interesting thing that uh, the phenolase of grapes uh, roughly, uh, well, at first we saw, thought it increased to fourfold, but we later found that it increased up to six or eightfold, as a matter of fact, when the grape was bruised. In other words, you take intact, obviously you can't get the enzyme out without bruising the grape, but if you take intact berries right out of the vineyard, being careful not to jostle the cluster or anything like that, and then when you're ready to grind them up to get the enzyme out, do it very rapidly and quickly and measure the activity, you get a certain level. If, on the other hand, you take the grapes and shake them in an Erlenmeyer flask till they're pretty thoroughly bru bu bruised, you will find an increasing enzyme level for a period of time until you apparently get a complete bu bruising, and then it will level off and perhaps drop down as uh, oxidation products begin to inactivate the enzyme. And this happens so rapidly, as Traverso showed, that it can't be a matter of protein synthesis. It's got to be a conversion from a relatively inactive form to a more active form. And apparently the enzymes, com the phenolase enzymes commonly occur in some sort of a molecular, uh, the, the individual monomeric unit of the enzyme that's active weighs about 40,000 molecular weight. And then several of these, usually around four, but apparently not invariably, are linked together in some way that they're still active, but they will become more active when these monomeric units are, are dispersed. And we think this has an important relationship then to the disease, to the pest and injury response uh, system of any plant, including the grape. So that when the major, a major response to injury is the mobilization of phenols and the oxida oxidation of the phenols to brown material, which then initiates uh, suberization and lignification and sealing off the wound, it would seem reasonable that this defense mechanism uh, is related to this enzyme's uh, activity and effective content, and it does appear that that's the case. Yes, Jed? Well, well, in following that line of thought, when you take uh, grapes that are infected Right. Yes. The plants, the response or the I'd like to know. I think it's uh, the best evidence in the literature is that it's some of both. But I think you're right that a great deal of the response that we've attributed to the mold is probably just because the berry is activated itself. 
and Treferso didn't study that point, but did study uh, shriveled grapes on the vine, and they found that it was activated uh, to a considerable extent. So that if you have windy days and the grapes are beat around, or if you have uh, shriveled grapes particularly and they're beat around, then the uh, enzyme content relative activity goes way up. And he did show, interestingly enough, if you do the bruising under nitrogen, this increase doesn't occur. So it wasn't an artifact, and it wasn't something that uh, uh, had no apparent, you know, just sort of a freak of observation, it seems to me. But clearly any plant injury ordinarily involves oxygen contact, and that would in turn then indicate that this is an oxygen-related activ activation to some degree. Any other comments or questions on this aspect. Well, the phenolase is the enzyme of importance in most foods and including grapes or, and early stages of winemaking. Uh, there are, uh, lacase is another enzyme that's involved. Both lacase and tyrosinase are uh, copper containing enzymes. However, the copper is not held in a heme form in either of the two. Uh, it's held in uncertain ways, uh, but it is interesting that in the phenolase, it's only the cuprous form that's active, whereas in the lacase, it's the cupric form that's active. Uh, so that uh, this is another way of showing they're quite different. In the, the uh, isolated lacase, the protein enzyme is bright blue, and the tyrosinase is not. It's uh, colorless. Uh, or at least uh, cream colored, the best you can do from isolation viewpoint. The lacase is apparently much more restricted in occurrence in nature. It occurs in this, uh, uh, the Roos genus, the ones that give us poison oak, poison ivy, and the lacquer, and so on. So they have a fair content of lacase. And it's different mainly, and it's called paradiphenol oxidase. So it does act heavily on the uh, benzoquinone, the 1,4-quinone type compounds, and uh, doesn't have the hydroxylation uh, uh, effect that the tyrosinase does. Um, tyrosinase is not very active with uh, paradiphenols, or, e or either not very active or completely inactive, depending on the particular uh, phenol involved. Whereas the paradiphenol form, the lacase form, is active with both but uh, relatively speaking, uh, more active with the para dihydroxybenzene type. Peroxidase can produce oxidative change of phenols, and peroxidase, of course, is an iron-containing heme compound, much uh, related to hemoglobin in the blood and so on. Uh, the porphyrin, iron-porphyrin unit, is important to its activity. Uh, it reacts with phenols as a fairly nonspecific type reaction, but uh, will produce, uh, will accept hydrogens from phenols with the net result that the phenol becomes oxidized. Again, primarily it has, it can produce hydroxylations, but of a rather nonspecific associated to the hydrogen peroxide uh, type reaction. And so while phenolic browning can be catalyzed by, and oxidation can be catalyzed by the peroxidase, it's not so uh, controlled nor so uh, well understood. And generally speaking, peroxidase reactions would prefer to work with some other more active substrate like ascorbic acid. However, uh, there are some points there that might be made that even tyrosinase, which has no activity at all against ascorbic acid, will not oxidize ascorbic acid by producing the quinone and then the ascorbic oxidizing that, having a lower redox potential. Uh, the net effect of a tyrosinase phenol system in the presence of ascorbic acid is to use up all the ascorbic acid very rapidly, uh, and uh, although the enzyme isn't acting on the ascorbic, in, in effect it's producing the oxidation of the ascorbic. And no quinone buildup can occur as long as the ascorbic is present. Uh, this is why uh, the grape is not a very good source of vitamin C, but it, wine is a zero source of vitamin C, and uh, grape juice, if you care to try to study ascorbic acid in grapes or grape juice, you'll find it a very frustrating experience because it disappears just while you're sneezing at it. You just can't, uh, you can't hardly protect it from oxidation. And it's not because the ascorbic itself is all that reactive, but rather the enzyme system that reacts the ph with the phenols then has a coupled effect to remove the ascorbic. Uh, the oxygen uptake of grapes is 
so fast as to be almost unbelievable. Uh, you can, uh, there have been experiments, for instance, putting grapes in a desiccator with some kind of a big heavy weight, which is held by magnets, and so you have a closed system, uh, put oxygen in the desiccator, release the magnets, the weight falls on the grapes, the grapes get crushed, and you pick up oxygen. Well, it's been shown that a kilo, <coughs> calculating to uh, this basis, a kilo of grapes uh, will pick up around 200 milligrams of oxygen, which is a great deal of oxygen, uh, in, a, in a matter of minutes after crushing. So it just <laughs> picks up that oxygen like nobody's business. I may have mentioned somewhere along the way the first Warburg experiments we did with wine where we were making the wine alkaline and uh, uh, measuring the oxygen uptake. Uh, I hadn't thought too well ahead. I was just, you know, in the lab trying things. And it uh, sucked the manometer fluid right out of the Warburg right back into the reaction flask because it was so fast. I couldn't measure anything. It just, and it was gone. So we diluted and worked more carefully from that point on. But at least the reaction, both enzymatic and non-enzymatic, with oxygen and phenol can be very rapid. While we're on that point, there's one other thing that I might mention. The optimum pH of tyrosinase on phenols is generally given around 5.5, depending on the source of the enzyme and so on. But if you see plots of optimum activity uh, or plots of activity measured by browning or oxygen uptake, you often see this kind of thing, where this is pH 5.5, and it's usually a bit higher but there's another peak over here around pH 8 or so. And this is a more variable. This is fairly rigid. And I've never seen in the literature anybody explain why that happens. But I'm rather disgusted that nobody seems to, maybe they think everybody knows, but I suspicion they haven't stopped to figure out why. What this is telling me, and I think telling anyone, is that the enzyme has a pH optimum about pH 5.5, and the activity of the enzyme falls off. But the oxidizability of the phenols becomes so much greater as you get alkaline that even though the activity is falling off, it's not zero yet, and you'll get a secondary, usually wider, more diffuse peak. Uh, it's uh, approaching alkaline or in alkaline range. Uh, so that that's, I think, why you get the double activity peak from this sort of thing. If you didn't have the enzyme, then you would get maybe something like that, uh, so that the enzyme is doing one kind of thing, and the uh, alkalinity is doing uh, is, is influencing the same kind of reaction, but giving them this double uh, optimum activity. I think those cover the points that I wanted to make as far as uh, the kinds of reactions that occur in general and something about uh, what they may mean. I think I would like to go on. Let's see. From this point, I think I will go with uh, a couple of illustrations of how phenol oxidation products can interact with other browning uh, units. So, for instance, we can have the phenol aldehyde reaction affecting what the color is that we get and how much of it we get. Now, we've mentioned in the analytical discussion very briefly that you can react vanillin with catechin in an acid solution and produce a bright red colored compound. Well, the bright red colored compound is believed to have this kind of a structure. And notice that what's happening is you're getting the vanillin aldehyde to react with an open position in the fluoroglucinol ring. And then the double bond shifts so that you stabilize this quinone methide and with the conjugation produced, produce a rather specific bright red color. And you can extend this same kind of reaction, in fact, to synthesize flavonoids so that fluoroglucinol plus, plus the properly chosen synamaldehyde will condense and eventually can be cyclized to produce a flavonoid, or in this case, uh, a, a flavillium salt. And we mentioned and showed you the reaction between fluoroglucinol and formaldehyde. And we said, remember that the, the compound is white or cream colored when first produced, but with time turns orange. Well, the oranging, uh, I think, is related to this kind of reaction, that first you're getting the uh, methylol substitution and then the cross-linking to make a polymer. But part of the polymer then is converting to the quinone methide. And again, we're getting the same kind of thing we get with melanin formation in that you have a large polymeric unit which is being stabilized with many chromophores in sometimes rather reactive condition, but being stabilized because of the substitution within a large three-dimensional uh, molecule. So the orange, orange color 
has its origin in the production of uh, quinone type products after the polymerization. The polymerization occurs by a direct substitution carbon bond formation and then the migration of electrons will give the quinoidal type structure which has then the visible color. And there are many other such reactions but this is just one series then that indicates that phenols either can be stabilized in producing a color without oxidation, none of these involved oxidation, or uh, the quinone structures can be built into polymers and stabilized to add more visible color. So that's one kind of phenolaldehyde reaction that might influence browning. We'll go ahead next time with other examples.